Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give you some info on Zoom controls. Um, and so the, the first hour, we'll be hearing from Tom and Kent. Um, we'll have a five minute break and then we'll come back to do Q&A discussions. And so if you hover uh, your mouse over the screen on the bottom, uh, you'll see your mute, your stop or uh, start video. And then in the bottom, um, in the middle is a chat and you can utilize that chat box to ask your questions. Um, but once we come back from break, you can also unmute and, and verbally ask your questions. Um, so here we get going, livestock integration. We have Tom Cotter. He is a Minnesota Soil Health Coalition board member and mentor. Um, and then Kent Solberg, he's the senior technical advisor with SFA and also a consultant for understanding ag. So Tom, you wanna to take it away with integrating livestock. All right, is my screen up there? No. Not yet. Oh, I thought I had that share before. Oh, yep, yep, hit the share screen again. Okay. Now we got it? Yes. Okay, all right. So livestock integration into covers. Uh, I will tell you, my dad used to always go to the coffee shop and every farmer there would say, well, it only works because you got cattle. Well, you know what? That's not true. Covers work on everything. Just livestock is, is always icing on the cake. It always makes it even better, so. Uh, just because this is a livestock thing, don't think that covers don't can't be on everything. Okay. Uh oh. I can't move my screen. Oh, there we go. All right. So a little bit about myself. You guys can read that. I will tell you something a little more personal. Uh, I was adopted. So growing up as a kid, I was always thankful for everything. Uh, looking back on my whole life, I had a great mom and dad, great dad. I've actually met my biological dad. Great to have, but always be thankful for everything you got. And when you're thankful for something, you'll actually take care of it better. And that's why, you know, that's why I told you this story because that's why I take care of the ground because I'm very thankful for what's out there. Uh, now, hopefully you read the background uh, covers and cow calf uh, graze everything. And I think that bottom thing is probably the most important. My goals are to graze everything uh, financially, you know, farmers are in a tough position. So I want to get two income sources out of every acre and livestock integration into covers helps me do that. Uh, yeah, now the corn is high, five dollars. It doesn't mean that you stop doing that. You know, these these prices of incline and decline, they're they're going to be all over the place. But the benefits of getting two incomes is is well worth it. So me and my dad uh, got clean water certified. I'm I'm really proud of that. I'm actually more proud that my dad got to be around to see that. So you knew this farm was going the right direction. Uh, I always tell people that, you know, I never was trying to get that, but when you do good things, good things happen. Uh, and one of the best things on this water quality is you, you get a $5,000 grant, you know, available for you every year. So you can run fence lines for your cattle. You can run water lines. I'm going to be running water lines this year. Uh, very good thing to have and, and take, take advantage of that money. So... So why do I graze covers? Well, right now I have 50 cow calf pairs and the feeders. They're all grass fed feeders. So it, instead of being done in, you know, 14 months, 16 months, whatever, it takes me longer because I'm grass fed, but I'm also getting that premium on the backside, uh, which makes it worth it. But right now, you know, dollar 25 for feeders, which is probably low, a dollar 10 per for cows per day is probably low, but I like to just use that to, as an example, but you know, 117 bucks a day, I'm spending uh, 3,500 a month. I graze typically one to two months in the spring. And then after uh, summertime grazing and pastures, I come back and hit it 
for another four or five months. So as you can see, that savings in a tough year, I'm at least 14,000. In a good year, I can save up to $28,000 on just grazing my covers. Uh, what would it cost to buy feed? You know, double the cost probably. And the good thing is now I can park my corn chopper. You know, was, the air conditioner wasn't working too good. It was really hot in there. So uh, now why multiple methods of forage? I, I like it because I never know what the season's gonna bring. So there's dry weather concerns. There's wet weather concerns. Uh, forage prices go up and down. Like I said, if you're gonna buy everything, that's a lot of money that you're gonna be throwing out there. Uh, I, I like to take buy seeds and let the sun grow my plants as compared to paying for someone else to grow it and then I go buy it. Uh, feed shortages, you never know what's gonna happen out there in the livestock industry. So uh, always, always having covers on hand gives me opportunities and options. Uh, lots of times with multiple methods of forage, you have a lot of warm season and cool season. So that helps me out. And if it's a warm or cold growing season uh, and you know, more diversity always makes healthier livestock. There's just no way around it. It's just like people, you know, Mike, if you got kids and they are stuck on pizza, they're not gonna be very healthy, but if they can eat their broccoli and their, you know, burgers and salad, that's much better. And of course the two income revenues per acre, that's, yeah, that's a no brainer. And then building healthier soils. Every time my livestock is on the ground on the cover crops, it is producing nutrients. It is exciting the microbes. I'm waking up, you know, the microbes in the ground that have been sitting there in just a corn soybean rotation. Now they have livestock back on the ground. That's how it's supposed to be. You can actually look at a lot of the national parks. You know, a hundred years ago, they weren't just bare desert, desert ground. They actually had plants on, they had animals. And the only reason why the plants were growing is because the animals were on it. So many advantages. So in the summertime, you know, take advantage of that winter moisture. If you have that cover crop out there, that's gonna grab everything. This picture right here, if it was a dry year, those guys are all scrambling. You know, they're, they're worried about how do I save that moisture? I'm no-till, strip-till, whatever. I already have something green growing. Now here, I took advantage and I just planted it. Of course, that's a far away field. But if I had to, I could capture that forage. Now, how about the other times? When instead of dry, now we're wet. You know, most guys think that, oh, it's only a dry time that's going to help you. But on the wet side, if you're doing covers, typically you're going to be into soil health practices and you're going to go to no-till or strip-till. Well, for me, on the wet side, I have that good soil structure. So as you can see, let's see, as you can see, my neighbor has water standing. That's actually my cousin, great guy, does a good job farming, but he's stuck in his old ways. He's got water standing, but yet I have 50 head of cows out grazing 10 feet away. Would I be able to do that if I did tillage and no covers? No, it would look just like that. But since you're doing the no-till practices and the cover crop program, uh, now I have soil structure. So in a wet year, this actually saved my butt because I was actually out of feed and I was able to get out there on those corn stalks. It was a wet year. I could barely even get into just the straight rye, but with the corn stalk stubble, roots holding, and then all the cover crops in between, I was able to graze and that saved my butt. And I'll tell you what, this is what they're grazing. That red clover right there, that was interseeded uh, the year before. This is actually a transition to our organic field. Uh, I put the livestock out there and they cleaned that field up so good, I was actually worried that I might, uh, they might be questioning how I got my field so clean. So in the organic side, man, that's a plus. And the livestock, it's, you know, it's amazing how much money you can save, so. So for me, cover crop grazing plan, I typically will try and graze the first of April. It doesn't always happen. You know, Mother Nature's kind of pushed us back the last couple of years, uh, but that's always my goal. I have a goal and if I get the right stuff put out there, it can happen as long as there's not a ton of rain, but 
that's usually previous fall plant cover crops or as you saw the summer v6 v4 interseeding uh and then june july and august I, I go to my pastures and i really only go to those for those three months because i know i have a lot of covers coming and this last year i actually went to summer grazing and then came in september start grazing a pea field and i was able to even come back to the pasture and graze for another week and give everything out in the fields a break too so it's very nice to have those options but typically in september uh, usually about september 10th or 15th they go out into canning crops small grain fields there's v6 corn in the city and there's soybean september in the city and i'll show those as i go along here so this is springtime this the fall before is soybeans I actually just, just doing a trial, I just spread the stuff with the pendulum spreader and incorporated it with a rotary hole. Uh, and the whole idea was, you know, I'm trying to track how long it takes to plant. You know, when you're combining soybeans, you don't want to stop and have to take a drill over, you know, 200 acres, because that might take a while. This thing, 40 foot wide, going eight, nine miles an hour, pretty easy. It, it did a fabulous job. And it doesn't matter, I first started, putting covers in with the disc and then when I had to VT I still have the VT I also use the rotary hole I use crumblers use all different sorts of tools but right there to me that gives me options now springtime grazing there you go I've actually switched my calving to happen when they're out on this grass as compared to in a feedlot typically my cattle aren't locked in the feedlot except for usually all of March because uh, we're warming up too much. I don't want to mess up the fields. Uh, but I will say if you have good structure, it gives me a little bit of leeway, but not a lot. I don't want to destroy the ground if it's too wet. But to have a calf born out on this is much healthier. Uh, udders stay clean and the cows are happy. And here, this is actually a sweet corn field that got strip tilled. And again, I'm just showing options. I'm not planting that sweet corn. This was a later planting sweet corn. I could have went out there and grazed it as long as it's dry enough. Uh, options, options, options. And when I do that, you know, when I graze in April and May, my summertime pastures get a, a jump start. They get a healthier root system put into the ground. I have some neighbors that the first of April, they're out on their pasture ground. So before we even get to June, their pasture fields are already beat down. Uh, I don't like to do that. I typically only graze soybean fields, but like I showed you with that sweet corn, the sweet corn is an option uh, to go later, but I would only do that if it's only dry enough. So when you got those nutrients out there, you know, now, now you're capturing nutrients, producing nutrients, reducing and leaching, but I'm also giving myself opportunity to get rid of manure. I am out on a structured soil. I can cut forage, to which I've been up to probably a little over 11 ton on the rye. I typically like to put a blend in, a winter rye and a winter trit. You know, if I'm after tonnage, I'm winter rye. If I'm after quality, it's winter trit. I'm after bull, so I usually do like a 60-40 split rye being the heavier one, uh, just because tonnage is important but I want that quality and as you can see in that middle picture there's rapeseed in there you know for the longest time I thought rapeseed was only for you know pigs that's everything I read is all oh, hogs only you know not cattle well that's you you can get your cattle to eat it and they absolutely love it so don't don't think that you can't do something just because you read it somewhere put it on your farm try it see where your cattle are get them trained they will eat it uh, this is actually me spreading manure, my boy, out on organic transitional ground. Uh, just because you don't have livestock doesn't mean that you have manure. You can still have covers and have manure, and it's green manure, and you have livestock under the ground, so you're still feeding. Even if there's no cattle, hogs, chickens on the farm, you are still a livestock farmer if you're growing covers. Uh, this, I'm gonna jump through summertime grazing. I typically only use it for if it's a field or transition to organic. So right here, nice blends. I get the cattle out there. I don't like to do alfalfa because then I'm taking all the nutrients off. 
And then three years when it goes to organic corn, why would I want to have less nutrients? So I put the cattle out there, but it's very important that you do the planting of your covers. Uh, I made the mistake of putting annual ryegrass in there, which did an awesome job, but it was a little harder to control after that third year. Uh, so be careful with what you plant. I actually, when I, when I have summertime grazing opportunities, I actually come back every fall and plant more covers and start kind of guiding that route to more of a heavy legume mix for corn. Uh, here you can see I'm in there with my vertical till. The cattle grazed it all summer. I let it grow back a little bit. I planted some more and then they grazed it again. And there's what it looked like at the end of the year when it was all done, but I had a lot more species still coming up from underneath. I love that ground cover. If I'm switching to organic, and even, even if you're not switching to organic, this is still, you know, very, very high on my list of what I want out there. I want that ground coverage solid. I want it growing actively multi-species. The cattle are out there spreading their manure, exciting that soil. And when that soil gets excited, guess what? It'll excite that organic corn or whatever you're going to in the future. So cover crop seeding for grazing. Uh, Talk just a little bit about the summertime mixtures. That, that's pretty simple. You plant that in the spring. Uh, if you're having warm season in there, you're waiting probably to June 1st. Uh, but typically on most fields for me, I have the canning crops and small grains that I get large, anywhere from seven to 30 away species. I have my June, you know, mid-June interseeding of corn. That gives me huge options. And actually it's a great way to introduce more diversity into a program because if you're doing just a typical winter rye program that's great but don't settle on one thing keep progressing and you know I, I can't graze after corn stalks if I plant after the corn's out but I can graze if I'm planting in there earlier in the year because I'm capturing that rain during the year I'm capturing that sunlight and I turn around and I give it to my cattle they will make everything better and then of course, early September, you can go out with the high clearance seeder or an airplane. Uh, I really like the high clearance. It gives me options to, to graze more ground. You know, typically I'd be looking at, you know, canning crops, I could graze that. And I learned how to interseed and now I could graze those acres too. And then interseed into soybeans and, you know, late August, September 1st uh, through, I think probably the 15th, it all depends on the, the weather that's happening at that time. But now, it gives me capability to graze more acres. So it, it's pretty amazing if you keep doing it and just keep adding and working hard. And of course, after harvest, your V team or no-till drill, you're not gonna be able to graze that. Uh, I should say on that number three, the early September seeding and the soybeans, you really need to have a good September to capitalize on grazing. Uh, if it's cold, there's probably not going to be enough to graze. If you have nice, warm, and sunny, uh, a couple of years ago we had nice, warm weather, but we didn't have much sun. Well, the covers didn't grow good. But if you put those two together and have warmth and sun, you can put out a pretty good cover crop to be grazing on. And then again, it's even more established for the following year. Uh, here's my VT after uh, sweet corn. I kind of like the VT because I get to cover the ground faster, <laughs> but also I have pretty large equipment out there after, you know, pea combines or sweet corn trucks and semis. So the VT is, works for me. Would I rather have a no-till drill? Heck yes. I don't mind having just a little bit of slice in that soil though after those big rigs. And here you can see, I move right along. Uh, planted up to three three-way species with this thing and, and it typically works great. So I get just, I don't have to worry about putting new blades on every year. I'm just trying to mix just a little bit of seed with the soil. As you can see, it flies right along. Of course, this is some of what I have afterwards, you know, a couple months. So after the peas came off, I planted or sweet corn. This is what I can come up to. Uh, typically, I let it get up to you know, between the knees and the hip height before I start thinking about grazing, I want to get it established. And of course, 
if I want to cut for forage, that's always an option. Uh, if it's going to be cut for forage, I'll typically go heavier on the sorghum sedan and go for tonnage. If I'm for grazing, I'm usually want a little more diversity and stuff, they'll graze easier. But also when I'm doing those mixes, if I'm grazing, if it's going to be later in the year, I make sure I get more upright uh, cover crops out there to maybe withstand the wintertime grazing. Or if it's earlier, I, I don't worry about that as much. And I always, I always think if, you're, if you have the option to do summertime plantings after peas, sweet corn, oats, wheat, you know, give your livestock a smorgasbord. You know, as many varieties in there as possible. It's absolutely amazing. The first year that I did this, I thought I was going to be all smart. I had my paddocks lined up. And I know Kent will talk more about paddocks, so I'm not going to cover too much of that. But I had them in paddocks and I sat out there and I watched what those cattle came in and I started writing down what they ate. You know, went to the grasses first and the sorghum. And I thought I knew everything until two weeks later, a week later when I moved into another paddock, they went in and started eating something totally different. And I thought, you know, <laughs> here I am, man, trying to think that we know it all and we don't. So sit back, watch your cattle. They know what to eat and they know when to eat it. Uh, so it's qu quite amazing. And of course, these plants, all these different plants are pulling up different nutrients at different times of the year. It's just like a, a purple top turnip. Before the frost, they won't touch that thing. After a good freeze, all those starches turn to sugar and then it's like kids in a candy shop and they're going around biting every single one. So plants different times of the year that's why i like diversity out there and of course when you do that these animals are as healthy as can be that's where they want they want to be eating with their heads down on the ground they don't they weren't made to eat out of the feed bunk so you're gonna get a lot, lot better grazing and a lot of healthier cattle and even the belted cows get you know pretty healthy except for this one and of course, the underground livestock you have. That's what I was talking about before. Even if you don't have cows, chickens, pigs, you still have livestock in the ground. You can still consider yourself a livestock farmer because when you're planting those covers, you are feeding the population that's under the ground. And that's probably the most important one. You know, get those guys excited, get them moving. We've, we've done too much tillage and chemical and we've wrecked their home. You start planting covers and you're building the home for them. You're building, you're giving them food. That livestock is there. And now I will say, you know, this is the after canning or after, this was after pea field. My our planter ran empty and we didn't catch it, so I had to come back and plant a rye trit with some barley in there, and that's the green. Everything else was the warm season mixes. I always thought the cattle wanted just green. No. Like I said before, those plants have different nutrients, different time of the year. These, this livestock, all these cattle are more in the dried off, dead warm season than they are out on this grass. So for me, I would have said they're after the green. The cattle are saying, no, I want it all. They are eating the green, they're eating the dried up, the dead stuff, the nutrients are still there. Uh, pretty amazing. And of course, afterwards, I look at this and I, I see a gold mine. I see little gold nuggets everywhere because that manure is building soil health right in that square foot. And then I always say soil health has a ripple effect. Now that square foot starts going outward. And now that one cow pie that only is covering a square foot, I'm getting five square feet of soil health benefits. So very nice to have them go out and spread it. I don't have to do that. And of course, in the winter time, you know, the, this cereal rye and trit and purple top turnip underneath the snow are, are still fabulous. They will go down there and they will graze. And I've been in grazing the snow up to the knee high, but typically if they can get down, if they can get their eyeballs still not in the snow, they will get to it. Uh, and that rye is absolutely paddleable. I've pulled that up in the wintertime like that in January, and it chews just like a piece of gum. It's so good. And of course, the livestock all in the wintertime, 
there's no problem with wintertime cold. Even right now, my cows, I was out there at 10 o'clock last night, shining waters. Most of them were still out in the field, laying out, you know, in the wide open. Just a very light few, and they're kind of the wimpy ones. Those are the cows I don't want to keep, the ones that have to go to the shed. I want the cow and feeders that are going to stay out in the field because that's where it's the most healthy. Uh, and as you can see, 14 right there, he's, that's a pretty healthy grass-fed calf. So that's following sweet corn mixes. I had the opportunity to do large mixes. Now going into interseeding. And I showed this slide, I believe, last week too. But not only am I putting plants out there for my livestock to graze, I'm also feeding the underneath ground. And of course, you can see the ground is pretty good cover. It has a home. Now it has food for the microbes and soil life. Now I'm putting food out there for later on grazing for livestock. And I'll play this. Tom, the sound's not coming through. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. That did not go through uh, for sound, but I'll tell you it was annual ryegrass out there is, is the base program for my inner seating. And I always have a red clover in there because that just does fabulous. I love bayou kale in there for grazing. Uh, that's really a nice plant that stands upright. Uh, does a great job for winter time or even after the snow is you know, eight inches deep, 10 inches deep. It still stands great. Uh, I think on that slide, I said I put a faba bean in there. With my rotary hole, I do not get as good uh, ground contact. So I kind of steered away from the peas and the faba beans and would throw a vetch in there instead or a buckwheat. I love to have them buckwheat in there also. But as you can see there, the ground was lightly covered we didn't the cover crops did not come through very good that springtime but even though the covers didn't come through i still had soil health out there and so i am getting out there and planting my covers for forage coming in the fall uh yeah here you can see here's kind of the main mix if it's grazing i go up to 18 pounds of annual rye grass if i'm not grazing i drop it down to anywhere between 12 and 15. I love the medium clover out there because that just always does good everywhere. The purple top turnip, like I said before, that turns the sugar when it freezes. So I like to have that in there. Uh, the bayou kale is just fabulous. That's probably the best, best feed source. I know a lot of people talk about radish, but really if you're going to be grazing, a radish, they love the tops. But once they walk by and kick that tuber, that plant is done. You know, that all of a sudden that's going to start releasing the nitrogen in the fall when you don't want to release unless you have a good grass cover out there but you know that that's why diversity is so important uh so i kind of tend to wait steer away from the tillage rash just for great because of the grazing purposes uh i i kind of think it's an overpriced you know rock star in the cover crop world that's where steve groff got everyone started was with the rash but that bayou kale does fabulous so and then buckwheat, I, I do like to get pollinators out there. Uh, am I gonna get to graze that? No, but am I gonna get the insects, the beneficial insects? Yes, and if I'm grazing, it's good to have beneficial insects around, so. And here you can see uh, in the fall time harvest, this is that same field interceding. And when I was combining that, it smelled absolutely fabulous. I mean, it smelled like a great salad. Now, have you ever heard anyone say that? Usually it's a great steak, not great salad, but you know, that's the cow's superpowers. They turn good grass into good steak. So I let them do their job, but it was uh, fun, fun harvesting when it's like that. And of course, after harvest, this is probably about a week later, everything really started coming through and it's ready to graze. And now remember, I've been talking about if you don't have livestock, there's a really good trend out there of, of vegans that love to get forage. So 
now you can come up with free range vegans. You don't have livestock, put it on the paper. Get those vegans out there, free range vegans, best kale you could ever want. But just make sure you use high strength fence because they're not very smart, all right? So a little humor there, but on the other side, you know, 60 inch corn options. I still wish I was back on my 36 inch planter because I think I can nail that interseeding for covers, for grazing year after year. Whenever I'm planting into the, into the V6 or V4, my corn varieties are typically shorter varieties. So that's very important if you wanna be grazing, look for shorter varieties. The 60 inch, you know, there's, that's been a lot of talk about that. And I really think it's either if you have livestock or if you're thinking organic, are probably the two best positions to be in to use 60 inch corn. And Grant, a conventional guy that has no livestock and no uh, uh, organic opportunity, they can still do it. But I think it's much better when you're getting feed off of it because there, there's a one to two tons worth of feed right there. In the organic world, you can grow your legumes in between. You can grow your insect insecticides in there because you're bringing in pollinators you're bringing insects. I've been playing with that in the organic side, uh, failed this year just from nitrogen, but I will tell you that corn looked absolutely fabulous all year long. No worry about bugs because I had a lot of diversity in between. That being said, it was a failed organic, but it was not a fail field because I got to turn on and use that forage for my livestock. Livestock just gives you so many opportunities. Uh, this is going away from the V6. This now I'm planting either into corn or soybeans. That's where I really like the high, the high clearance seeder. This is a friend of mine, Andy, out here. I really like the soybeans because now I'm giving myself options. I'm giving myself a whole nother bunch of acres that the cattle can get out and graze. And I know farmers have talked about, oh, this is, you can't cut that. If that gets too tall, I've never had a problem. That, that rye can get eight inches tall, 10 inches tall. It still is very pliable, so it lays over nice and neat. Uh, never a problem. But the, the capability of adding in all your soybean acres into the grazing plan is just, it's a no-brainer. And not that they're going to be out there getting a ton of forage, but they are going to be out there. They're going to be happy. They're going to be doing what they want to do. They want to graze green. Uh, they, You'll, you'll get many benefits out of that. So for me, a typical grazing plan is I have peas. You, you could also have small grains. That's why it's so good to diversify on your field, on your farm. Uh, but so I would plan that I'll graze that pea field. You know, I can usually get 60, 90 days. That's number one. Number two, I have interseeding. I can graze that. Soybean fields, as you can see, you can get some mixes in there. You can graze that and then come back to organic or back to a cornfield, transition to organic. Still growth out there. I jump around. I have everything fenced off now on about 750 acres. Uh, that's where that clean water comes in into play. You can get those grants. You can help build fence. I actually did it without that just because I saw the benefits, I knew the benefits, I want the livestock out there. Uh, going down to number five, sweet corn field. Do I graze everything? No, because I know in February right now, I don't have anything growing, but I captured that forage, put it into bales, wrapped it, and now I'm bale grazing. And what I really like about the bale grazing is, is I'm still building soil health even in the winter time. My livestock do not want to be in a shed. They do not want to be on concrete. So they get the choice to be out there in the fields grazing. And then every time I cut open that bale and the next day I come back and they have it all eaten and I pull that plastic up underneath that ground, there's still green grass growing. And this is happening in December and January. There's still green grass growing and I can still find worms. Now, where else are you going to see that in Minnesota in February? You know, it, it's absolutely amazing. So I really see I'm getting the livestock fed out there. I'm not moving any bales. I love that. It's good feed, but I'm still building soil health too. 
they're all connected. All right, and number six, I'm still bale grazing right now, and I will bale graze pretty much all of February. Come March, when we start getting, and it's possible in February too, we can get these warm and cool days. Whenever it warms up and starts getting sloppy, I pull all the cattle into the into the uh, into the farmyard, and then they go into the lots. I don't want to keep them in there. Uh, so if it cools back down, the ground gets good, I'll let them back out. But you never know with this wacky weather we have. We've had so many seasons in February where we freeze thaw and we have water running everywhere in February. That's not right. You know? And typically wherever that water runs, and I think I talked about this last week too, wherever that water runs and it chokes out that cover crop, I make sure when it is good out there in the springtime to get out and seed something down in those spots because typically they won't sit with that much water. It's just this wintertime uh, dams and water running. So always planting covers out there. And so in the end, you know, I'm capturing carbon and I'm capturing water. Those are two things you need to have, you know, a good farm, good livestock, and make money on all right and someday we probably will get paid for carbon i know there's you know all the agencies out there but i still think it's pretty new but livestock if you have livestock you're gonna have more grass out on the ground more covers you're gonna capture more carbon someday we will get paid for that and capturing water heck yes you know 25 years ago did anyone ever think we'd be buying bottled water you know, now that's a huge industry. I put more water in the ground when I have grass out there. So biggest cover crop failures. And of course, this is the same as last year, but I'm gonna cover it again because I think it's so important. The number one is you don't plant any. And I don't care if it's for forage or for cattle or just for the cover the ground, get something out there. And then also thinking you can't make it work. If you don't think you can make it work, then you're right. It's not going to work. But if you have a positive mindset, you can make the covers work and you can make design a grazing program to work with you. Uh, of course, networking with other farmers. That's what the Minnesota Soil Health Coalition is all about. And that's where you really learn when you start networking with farmers that are doing it. And now chemical mistakes. I did not cover that. I, I'm sorry. I'll kind of jump back to that interseeding. My interseeding program, uh, chemically, whenever you're grazing covers, the pre emergence herbicides are usually some of the toughest ones on grazing cover crops. So what I've actually shifted to now is I start, I'm starting to ban my pre emergence herbicide just over the corn row and I interseed in between. Uh, it, it works good for me and it kind of keeps me out of that, you know, gray area where you can't graze with certain chemicals out there. So I stay away from those as far as possible. I always, I know last week I said, if it's the biggest and baddest chemical out there, I can almost guarantee you that you're not gonna be able to graze if you put that down and then plant covers. So be very careful, read your labels. Uh, not realizing everything's connected, uh, it is. Not using the right seed at the right time, do not, put competing covers into V6 corn. That's super important, but you can still, so that takes out cereal rye because that will compete. And I know there's places up north that are making it work and that's great. But for me in my area in Southern Minnesota, it's just too much of a competitor. And you know, for every action, there's a reaction. When you choose it's positive or negative. That's, uh, that's in life in general. And of course, listen to mother nature. Uh, I will tell you that one of those first slides where the neighbor's farm was full of water and my cattle were all grazing on mine, I'm listening to Mother Nature. I'm putting the livestock out there. I have the covers. I have the reduced tillage, no-till practices. It works. All right. And of course, everybody has a story to tell. So make sure if you're doing covers and you're doing stuff, spread the word because uh, that's the only way we're going to get, you know, this movement or this practice growing. All right, and that should cover me. Well, thank you so much, Tom, for all that good information. And I will have 
uh, Kent Solberg uh, present and give us some information about uh, paddock sizing setting up. Um, and absolutely feel, feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Otherwise, after the break, uh, you can unmute and ask questions. So thanks, Kent, and take it away. Well, good morning, everyone. Oh, get some feedback there. Here we go. Well, Tom's always a tough act to follow, so I'll do my best uh, here. And, uh, uh, you know, the great thing about getting two presenters is, um, or even three sometimes uh, on the same session is it's just a much richer uh, experience for producers and, and for the students that are involved, um, uh, I think. So this is, this is just a great opportunity. So today we're focusing on one of the key soil health principles and that's integration of livestock. Um, none of these are more important than the next. They're all important, keeping the soil covered, minimizing disturbance, increasing crop diversity. And Tom did a great job of covering the importance of that diversity even for our above ground livestock as well as our below ground livestock keeping a living root in the soil. And we need to do all of this within the context of our particular field and farm. Integrating livestock is the quickest way to get an ROI uh, on that cover crop investment. And so that's, that's a very attractive uh, to a lot of producers as well as creating uh, multiple income streams from the same acre. <coughs> Excuse me, so how can we integrate livestock? Well. One of the ways is uh, instead of taking last crop hay, we could, we could graze that as stockpile forage. Yes, our crop acres can include hay ground. Uh, we can just glean crop residue out there. Uh, we can outwinter, one of the many outwintering techniques. Tom talked about what he's doing. I'm gonna spend a little more time on that to give you some more options and things to think about as we move forward. And then actually grazing covers themselves. So gleaning crop residue is kind of the low hanging fruit. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a quote waste product that's already out there. We can put animals out here and uh, other than getting up fence and having water for them, it's just, uh, it's just easy to do. And it is a way to integrate that. Now we can sweeten the pot a little bit. Tom talked about some great ways of doing that. And when we interseed covers uh, specifically with grazing in mind, uh, we're creating a more balanced ration. Uh, for those animals, and they're going to perform, as Tom talked about, much better. Tom went over some ideas here, uh, you know, annual ryegrass, cereal rye. There's some people in western Minnesota and South Dakota that have used winter wheat. Um, legumes, uh, great success in southern Minnesota and Wisconsin with red clover. Other people are seeing successes with Persian, Balanza, Elsike because of their shade tolerance. And then the vetches, uh, broadleaves. Um, Tom's had a great success with the Bayou Kale. Uh, we're also finding that the hybrid uh, brassicas, uh, just the hybrid bigger, tends to make them uh, more shade tolerant. And uh, Tom even offered some, some seeding rates there. So Tom talked about ways to, inter to increase interseeding success. And, and I don't think we can remind people enough about understanding and knowing what your herbicide history is. This has been I spend a lot of time helping producers throughout the winter um, who are new to this, trying to figure out how to integrate covers into their system and hopefully to integrate livestock. And this herbicide history is, is really a challenge, and especially now with all the different uh, tank mixes and so on and, and labeled uh, mixes that are coming out. Um, wow, this gets to be really, you almost have, you have to develop a matrix and go through uh, really determining what you can do. And oftentimes we just got to figure out how to get to where we want to be. And we may not get there year one And this herbicide history is absolutely huge. Um, thinking about reducing plant populations. A lot of producers I work with are dropping below a 32,000 plant population as a way to get enough covers down there. Um, we're finding there's been a lot of work done by Shannon Osborne over at South Dakota State University and what she has found is over the years is as we build soil health, we can reduce corn plant population, increase opportunity for covers and not sacrifice corn yield in the process. So that's very encouraging uh, as to what we can do. 
It's also, we know it's a struggle for those who are on 20 or 22 inch or 22 inch rows. It's, it's a struggle um, to get covers. Uh, the corn's doing what we want it to do uh, in that situation. It's, it's canopying out very quickly and shading everything out. So that makes it tough. You may have to think about row spacing again. Think about shorter day length corn. Um, we're not seeing in a lot of situations dropping some uh, day length corn down. We're not seeing the huge hits in yield, but it's creating more opportunity for getting some growth out there in the fall. Tom talked about feeding, seeding at V6. We've got producers now doing a lot of seeding at the V3 and V4 and not seeing uh, huge yield drags with that and getting better cover crop establishment. So that may be something to think about also. We've got to ensure good seed to soil contact. Um, if we're going to broadcast, generally it's recommended that we do it after a half inch rain, uh, particularly with the inner seeding. Uh, it's a little easier to time than counting on that weather forecast, which isn't always accurate. So, uh, but getting some moisture down there is important to get it to work. And then Tom talked quite a bit about wide row corn. Um, we're still, I think, trying to fine tune how that's going to work, but it does work. Uh, I, I think we're just trying to figure out how to make it work best for most people. Like Tom said, if he'd go back to his 36 inch row of corn, he'd probably be at a sweet spot. We have a number of people who are saying that their sweet spot is uh, just going alternating rows on 20 and 22 inch corn. So they're out to 40 to 44. Um, they're seeing less yield drop in their corn and yet still growing a lot of biomass out there in covers. So that may be something to think about if you're running with 20 or 22 inch equipment out there. One of the things to avoid, like Tom said, is uh, other warm seasons that are going to compete uh, with that corn. Stay away from the millet, stay away from sorghum sudan, stay away from sunflower, unless you want that in there if you're gonna chop it as silage. Um, but if you're still hoping to get a cash grain crop out of there, stick with some of these uh, shorter, lower growing uh, covers out there. I want to spend some time on outwintering. Um, great way to integrate animals out there. Uh, we're, we find that in a crop or a hay ground system, uh, something like feeding TMR or unrolling bales, we tend to have less of this clumping that when we see in bale grazing, although I do know people who do that, particularly using like baleage, they tend to clean it up quite well. It's not that you, <clears throat> excuse me, can't do it in a hang situation, but it tends, the bale grazing tends to work better in a pasture situation. So think about that application and how you're going to use that. And here's just, you know, Tom showed an example of results uh, in, in uh, the winter. This, this picture here is actually looking across this field here. So this is day one where TMR is being fed out here. This area in the back's already been covered, moving into a new area feeding TMR. So one day it's fed here, the next day here, the next day here, and so on. And you get this absolutely amazing degree of manure spreading out there come spring. Um, there's not many spreaders that could replicate that. That's just an outstanding job. And the beauty of doing this is like Tom alluded to is we're, we're not only feeding our livestock, we're also feeding the livestock and the soil as well as spreading the manure. And if labor is an issue on your farm and getting everything done, Boy, talk about knocking out three birds with one stone here. It's just a great opportunity out there. Uh, this is an aerial shot of a farm that has a long history of doing a really good job of bale grazing. And you can see these green spots here. Uh, that's where the bales were. And this is four years of coverage. So this was year one. This was year two, year three, year four. Uh, and you can see the, 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 it, that it lasts, uh, the impact of that lasts. Uh, and you can see that when we do a nice even distribution compared to a random distribution out there, uh, we get much more even coverage. Now, again, think of your context, think of your goals. If we're only going to do it once to get something jump started, like in a pasture, and, and we don't intend to bale graze ever again, we can do randomly and get by. But if we want to do this over and over again, over several years. Now we may not get back to some of these fields for six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. You know, we're not gonna go out there willy nilly if, if we got the fertilizer buggy from the co-op and go out there and spread, we're gonna do it with some pattern, some intentionality. And so that's what I'm just trying to point out here is do it with intentionality versus random. I've seen people who do it random year after year after year 
and they tend not to get even spread. It tends to congregate in certain areas and then they get frustrated because, well, I'm out wondering, but it's just not doing what everybody's telling me to do. And oftentimes the how versus the what that differentiates success. We may or may not we need a windbreak. A lot of people like to provide windbreaks and bedding pack for their animals. It can be a natural uh, windbreak here, uh, like we have in this picture. Um, the bedding pack, uh, we can dual purpose that box manure spreader uh, as a bedding spreader. Um, this is pretty cool. If you want to see a video of this, you can go on the SFA website and watch it. Uh, University of Minnesota Morris does this out with their cattle out there. Uh, when they outwinter. So it's just a neat way to get more utility out of that investment you've already made in that piece of equipment. Here's just another example. These, these are artificial windbreaks. This one happens to be made out of used steel. Uh, and this one happens to be made out of one by six lumber. And actually this windbreak in this picture is more effective than the windbreak in this picture because they've done the, the aerodynamics of this stuff and they find that our windbreaks should be 10 feet high and about 25 to 30% of the space should be open and 70 to 75% solid. We get the farthest downstream or downwind uh, reduction in wind velocity when we do that. And so if we've got one by six rough sawn lumber, we're gonna leave a one and a half to two inch gap. Uh, when we do that, the downwind protection's about four to five times the height of the windbreak. So we can be out there 40, 50 feet from a 10 foot high uh, windbreak. The mistake most people make is they put up a solid barrier and wind eddies around or swirls around those solid barriers. And it's the cattle ha have no place to be comfortable. Actually, I've seen them on solid wind barriers stand on the upwind side of that wind barrier or windbreak because if the wind is being lifted up and the velocity is less uptight to that windbreak, but you have to be tight up to it going over and it's more violent or more higher velocity on the downwind side. So just some tips about windbreaks if you wanna think about doing that and building it in. And by all means, if you got sheds, <clears throat> you know, use them. I work with a lot of dairy farms and this is their big concern that animals, they're not as tough as Tom's and, and they, they need a place to go. And if you got sheds, use it, that's great. Take advantage of what you got, what's your context. But this farm, they'll run a hot wire during the nice days across here and they won't let them in here. Those animals are only in there maybe, maybe 15, 12 to 15 days out of the whole winter. Um, they just don't need to be in there every day. It's gonna save a lot of money for you on bedding. It's gonna save time and labor on manure handling, but on those really crappy days when they need it, by all means, use it if you got it. Um, yeah, give it a try, make it you work. So Tom talked about a lot about covers after small grain, field peas, canning crops. Um, I just want to, this is just another example of that. And just some data, both in Iowa and South Dakota, they found similar net farm income on a corn soybean wheat rotation versus a corn and soybean rotation. And the point of that is, is when we add wheat, uh, to the rotation, like Tom said, it gives us that huge opportunity for adding a very diverse complex mix that in many years, uh, it's going to create enough biomass out there that we can get out and integrate cattle or graze that. And so um, a lot of people are nervous about going to small grains. They don't think it's going to cash flow, but they find that the net farm income difference on two different studies was, was not significant whatsoever. So, and it doesn't have to be every acre all the time. The South Dakota study, uh, wheat was one year and five in the rotation. So only 20% of the farm uh, was in a cereal, but it did create that opportunity to get livestock in there. Now, not that there's not opportunity with corn and beans like Tom just talked about, but it just creates a very different opportunity. So uh, some options for short season crops um, in the fall, uh, we're going to get the most volume for grazing off oats. That just consistently uh, across the board tends to be our most reliable. We can use tritical, triticale and your ryegrass, forage barley. If we want, we could even use rye. Uh, our legumes, uh, think about things like lentils, winter pea, vetch, uh, broadleaves, turnip, kale, rape, uh, the forage brassicas, and throwing in something like flax or buckwheat for some diversity. Uh, I encourage you to select at least one from each of the plant functional groups, being grasses, legumes, and broadleaves. 
the earlier we get them sown, the better results. And on average for all of Minnesota, obviously later in the south, earlier in the north, if we can sow before around mid to late August, we're gonna get the most growth out there. And every day you wait makes a big difference. Again, watch your herbicide history. Think about your termination methods and how you want to use this, how this fits into your cropping rotation. A lot of things, you know, uh, oats, uh, field peas, lentils, turnips, um, flax, buckwheat, those are going to winter kill uh, for us. We get a week like this in the winter, like we're seeing this week in Minnesota, all these things are going to be fried. We don't have to spend any money on terminating it. And again, plant those as quickly as possible after harvest, even just waiting three or four days. And I know people that have, this has happened to because they got rained out, they were getting across a field, storm came through, shut them down for a few days, went back and they said they were astonished at the difference in growth on just four days and not getting in the, that in the ground can make. Full season covers is part of a larger rotation. Here's this spring or summer, excuse me, uh, grazing opportunity um, that, that we can use that Tom talked about. South Dakota State University did some research on, on dairy herds going from a silage-based ration to a complex cover like we see in the picture here. And they had no significant difference in milk production uh, bouncing from that silage to this. And so it's very doable. Um, we can set these up to be a single graze system or a multi-graze system. In other words, uh, if we get these planted in mid-June, we could come in and graze these 45 to 50, 60 days later do a light grazing, take off no more a third of the biomass. And if we put multi-cut species in there and we have a good September, there's gonna be something to come back and graze October, November, December out here. Maybe we just need this uh, for grazing to extend our grazing season into the fall. Then we can think about adding single cut species. That would be things like forage sorghum, corn, um, sunflowers that we can add to the mix because those are single cut species. So. Think about how you want to use it. Lots of opportunities out here uh, to do this. And even in the multi-cut species, we could, if it was a big enough acreage, we could rotate through this twice, possibly in a really good year, three times uh, with our cattle. Tom already talked about spring calving on tri and uh, triticale, a great opportunities for April and May. You don't have that manure handling problem out there. You're probably going to see healthier calves, and there's still an opportunity for a cash crop to follow something like this. And a number of folks have done this and it works well. We can think again, other ways of double cropping. Uh, here's an oat forage barley uh, forage pea mix that was taken as baleage, and then that was followed with a complex cover crop mix like this. And they waited until November to graze like uh, something like this. We've already talked about single or multiple cut. Uh, the forage quality on something like this can be great, but do think about, like Tom said, think about those species that are going to stand up in snow. The animals will come into something like this and start eating on the tops and work their way down into the snow and find the other goodies that might be buried down there below the snow. So we've got a lot of people who are doing this, you know, with 16, 18, 20 plus inches of snow on the ground and it's working great. We really want to manage the grazing when we do this. We're going to get better forage utilization, better manure distribution, and we're really going to amplify soil re regeneration. When we get higher stock densities of cattle out there, we're going to excite the biology and the soil in the process. Plus, we're also going to get trampling. And strip grazing is probably the most common way to address this on grazing covers. Uh, for that utilization, for that manure distribution, and to get that pressed down uh, near the soil. We want to graze the best, really, and trample the rest. And when we leave that high carbon uh, material on the soil, that's, what's, that's what uh, we're going to get the most fungal uh, response from. And most of our agronomic soils are short on fungus. They tend to be bacteria-centric, and we really build soil health uh, when we stimulate the fungus. The other thing that's going on, and you'll see in this picture here, is there's still green plants there. There's still living plants there, and we need a living plant in the ground. That's one of those key soil health principles. So in the, you know, we're addressing all of those soil health principles uh, on a particular field when we do that, and that's where we get the most positive response. The other thing we can do is, if we leave enough residue out there, is actually prep these sites for no-till 
corn the following year, and we need uh, probably zero herbicide on something like this uh, and, and zero fertility added to it and can still get a respectable corn crop at very, very low cost. One of the things I would mention about doing this, you need about two to three inches of residue out there. Uh, you do not want to go in and plant um, when, when this residue is wet. You want to do this on the afternoon on a dry day when soil temperatures are warm enough for almost instant uh, corn germination out there for best results. So how do we make all this happen? It's modern fence technology that we have available to us. It, it's been around for longer than we think, but you know, 30 years ago, most people did not have the skill set or even know knew that this was available. Uh, it's it's now with internet sales and everything else, and much more interest in this, it's more available than it was before. And this can be both polywire and temporary. Uh, posts as well as semi-permanent designs, which I'll talk about a little more. And if we're dealing with small ruminants, uh, there's the ENET option uh, out there um, that you might find uh, valuable. So to have effective energized fences, we need a voltage. I like to see at least 7,000 volts on the fence. The energized fence is a psychological barrier. It's not a physical barrier. It's the shocking power of the fence that deters the animal. The posts and wire are simply the delivery system for that. But we need to have a good ground because the animal coming in contact with the fence is what completes the circuit and that's when the shock is delivered. So we need a good ground. You need to match your wire spacing to the class of animals that you're grazing out there. Your animals must be trained to this. So in the picture in the lower right there, you'll see a single strand of poly wire. That's the perimeter fence for 193 cow-calf pairs, <clears throat> excuse me, on 400 acres of covers being grazed in October here a few years back. These are cattle that are used to grazing behind something like this. They trust that their handler, their manager is going to give them enough to eat. They know that they're gonna get snapped when they get hit by this. They have no reason to be running outside of this. And this was very effective. Now, am I saying that to say you can go out and do this? Absolutely not, I'd never say that. All I'm showing is an example of in a well-managed system where they're checking all the boxes and getting it done, we probably can get by with less fence than we think. But at the same time, you need to base the number of wires you use on your context and what's gonna allow you to sleep at night, okay? So if you're along I-90, like Tom is, you may want more wires than uh, out on this county highway uh, that get, gets less travel. And that's gonna have to be your call and your decision, okay? But these other things are very important. In an energized fence, the number of wires aren't necessarily the answer to good livestock control. These other pieces are equally or more important. So based on that, and based on the fact that a lot of people don't have the cash or want to fence in the entire farm, we came up with this two wire semi-permanent high tensile fence design. Uh, it's two strands of 14 gauge, not the standard 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire. The reason being is it's lighter and easier to work with. You sacrifice just a little bit of strength in this fence, but not much. And if your animals are putting that much pressure on the fence, we got other problems we need to address first. So we sacrifice just a tiny bit of strength. It it's weighs less. It's easier to put up and take down, which is the idea behind this. This is for a fence that's going to um, going to only be grazed maybe one year out of three, four, five, six, seven. <clears throat> and you want to use these materials on multiple sites. And the reason we may want to do this is because we can recover 99.9% .9 of the materials off this fence and move it to another field and still have a life expectancy on these materials of out to 20 years. And at a material cost of 30 to 60 cents a linear foot, that's an incredible investment. That's a very, very low cost investment. So the fencing doesn't need to be expensive. For our gate and corner posts, we're using six inch diameter treated posts that are eight feet long that are set at least 48 inches in the ground. Our wires are at 30 and 40 inches above grade. We're using these wraparound insulators, which I'm not a huge fan of except in this situation, uh, but they're cheap. Um, we're using tension springs and strainers. I'll get into the line posts in a minute here. But when we're done with this, we can leave this $16 or $17 post in our corners. It's probably not going to be in the way of our field work. It's the biggest part of the labor here. Now our gate posts, we need to pull them. We might need to pull them out to get our equipment in and out. 
some of our field equipment, um, you know, that's going to be on a case by case basis. We can take the tension off this wire. We can nip it here. We can lift these off if we want, or we can leave these here and leave better quality insulators on here. But we can just use a gripple or a crimping sleeve to reattach these wires somewhere else if we leave a tail out here. And once you understand, stand this, understand the skills and technology behind this, it's pretty easy to do. For line posts, we're using 7 eighths inch uh, diameter by 60 inch or five foot long solid or uh, um, pre-drilled fiberglass posts for the line posts. These are a heck of a lot easier to put in and take out than a steel T post. Uh, so um, it's it just makes life easier. Yes, they're a little more expensive, but the labor saves you a lot. On average, these are gonna be 40 to 50 feet apart as you go around. If you've got dips and hills, you may have to increase that and adjust, make some adjustments for that. And if you get questions on that, we can talk about that later. Poly wire and reels, there's lots of options out here. Which one should I get, Kent? Well, it's kind of like asking me what pair of shoes should I buy? You need to try it and figure out what you like, okay? It's like buying a pair of shoes. I'm sure we've all had a pair of shoes we bought. We kind of thought they were great. They don't fit real well and they get relegated to the back of the closet. Same thing with reels. You got to figure out what you're going to use for you. Your is going to work in your situation. You can go El Cheapo and that's fine. Just chuck it in the dumpster at the end of the season. Or you can go with a high end and higher quality wire and make that last. I've got high quality wire and reels that I'm using that are 20 years old right now because we've taken care of them. I know people who just prefer the cheap stuff and chuck it in the dumpster. We have run the numbers and the more expensive stuff on a per year basis is cheaper than the cheap and chuck it in the dumpster. Same with posts. There's lots of post options out there. You got to find what's right for your situation and right, right for you. This is one of these seven eighths inch diameter solid fiberglass posts. Um, these are very handy for poly wire on making temporary gates, temporary corners, and even lanes for like outwintering. They're very durable, easy to use, easy to move around. Uh, the multi-wire posts may be valuable in your situation. A lot of people just like these, even if they only run one wire. They can use the top notch for uh, one class of animal and drop it down for another class of animal. This is historically what the beef producers have used was the ring top post um, now, or the pigtail post. Now they're going to ring tops. And then we've got different versions of fiberglass here. Again, figure out what's gonna use work for you. You gotta figure out how you're gonna make it hot. Here's just one option. Tie it off on a solid plastic insulator. Uh, you can make it hot with one of these jumper leads or you could just drape uh, the reel over the wire and do that. Um, a lot of these reels have locks on them. You can lock it and drape it on there too. That's another way. Or you can use this device called a zammer. When you're setting things up, you hook the wire in this non-conductive hook. When you're ready to energize it, you can't, I'm sorry, I got chopped off here. You can hook it to this conductive hook uh, and make it hot. Um, just a slick little deal. Water, we got to have water for these animals. Don't panic if you don't have uh, a frost-free water, but if you do, get it up and get the old Richie there, get it up and running and make it work. It's not super essential. By the way, these animals can walk. We got people that have their cattle walk up to a mile and a half back to water in the winter or late fall when we're doing a lot of this cover crop grazing and it's fine. Please don't try that in July when it's 98 degrees. Keep it simple. If you've got access to a hydrant and a tank, some above ground pipe and a hose, we can make it work in the summer. In the winter, go to a continuous flow setup. It's cheaper to do continuous partial water flow than it is to provide electricity in these systems. So what you do is you wedge it uh, partially open with a wedge of wood and then just wrap it with some electrical tape. It continuously flows. Make sure your overflow water goes away from where the cattle are. Now, maybe you can tip your tank a little so it flows over the edge. Maybe you need to plumb something in there, but just don't leave them a skating rink that they have to do. Cows don't like playing hockey. Uh, I'm not even gonna spend time on this because Tom talked about the scholarship available for ag water quality certification for all this infrastructure as well as covers. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit to wrap up on planning here. Um, this is just a chart showing different times of the year. Months are down here on when we could utilize for grazing all these different things. And this isn't even everything. So we got warm season annuals, cool season annuals, cool season pasture, warm season pasture. So our cool season pasture is running in here. We might be able to stockpile. 
uh, and use that at various times in the winter, probably never gonna have enough to go all winter long, but where can we use other things like warm season annuals? Well, heck, we could plant those and start using them in late July in some situations, or we could use them as some people we've got in Minnesota are now grazing into March using complex uh, mixes of warm season annuals. Where does it make the most sense to use cool season annuals? Where does it make the most sense to use perennials? Think about where those gaps might be in your farm. Think about how it may be in your rotation and how best to plug that in. Um, so what are some resource concerns? Because we don't just need to feed cows, okay? We can address other things like compaction, lack of water infiltration, uh, preventing wind erosion, um, building diversity uh, in the system, feeding biology, stimulating mycorrhizal fungi, uh, balancing that carbon nitrogen ratio, very, very important. Or maybe it's attracting wildlife or just wanting to see more wildlife diversity uh, out on your farm. Other things to think about, what's your location? What infrastructure is available? Is this a site that might flood come March or you're gonna have snow drifting problems in a tough winter in February? That doesn't mean you, you can't be out there just plan for that and have a contingency of those things might happen. Uh, this year so far that snow drifting hasn't been a huge issue versus a couple of years ago. What's your soil type? Sand, clay, loam. That's gonna determine to some degree what you put in your complex mixes. What's the cropping history rotation? We've already talked about this. What kind of planting equipment do you have available? And when do we wanna use this? Going back to that chart. We wanna see at least one example of each of these major crop types, cool season grasses, cool season broadleaves, warm season grasses, warm season broadleaves in, in our crop rotation. And the more, the better. You know, in a corn bean system, we only have two representatives, two representative groups here. What can we do to build in some of these other ones to build that diversity in? Again, are we hitting plant multiple plant functional groups? We've got grasses, legume, broadleaves with some examples here. What are the, can we use in these uh, to fill in some of the gaps here, but also to build complex blends? I define a complex blend as having at least three examples of each of these in a mix. More is even better. Some general rules for blends that I would throw out. Legumes, probably not more than 10 to 20% of the mix. We've probably been overusing legumes in some of our mixes and even in some of our rotations. Keeping that clover to about two or three pounds maximum in a combined blend. Tom had three pounds of red clover in his, just as an example. Brassicas, one to two pounds uh, in a mix. Tom was running about one and a half in his mix. Corn and sunflowers, if you wanna use those in a mix, great. Um, I wouldn't use corn if that field has been the year before or will be the year after going into corn. But if it's been something else for a long time, think about throwing that in. And we only need a pound or two of that, of each of those in a blend. Buckwheat, one to three. Tom was using two in his blend. Flax, very underused cover crop uh, in our mixes. Uh, again, like Tom talked about buckwheat, that's another one, flax and buckwheat. One to five pounds per acre can go a long, long way in stimulating microbiology. I do wanna talk about the dwarf sorghum Sudan uh, a little bit. It's a great one. Uh, if you wanna think about multiple grazings on a site or re, uh, during the course of a year, we're seeing better regrowth and recovery on that. And a lot of these sites that are only grazed uh, versus just a BMR sorghum Sudan. So think about that. Uh, if you're planning and I just toss that out as an extra tip. So I know we're running over Jennifer. So with that, I thank you and uh, people probably need their break and we can move to questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Kent. That, that had a lot of great information. Yes, so what we'll do, we'll take a five minute break, stretch your legs, get something to drink that's appropriate for you know mid morning, late morning. And we'll be back in five minutes. All right, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a good break, got everything done that you needed to get done. Um, now we're gonna open up to the, the question and answer and discussion portion. Um, and I do wanna put, uh, put the question out that was in the chat box. Um, what are the typical heights on that two strand system, especially when you, know, you gotta keep calves in there? Yeah, the system's 30, the lower wire is 30 inches, top wire is 40 inches above grade. Uh, it is designed for either stockers 
for spring calving cow calf pairs. If you're running fall calving cow calf pairs, uh, you're probably going to need to add another wire in there. Um, but we start getting calves over three weight. That 30 inch high wire generally does the job. If if they've been around or behind energized fence all season, coming into the fall on something like this, and they respect it, um, it's generally not a problem. But again you got to put in the number of wires you feel fits your context and your comfort level. Excellent. And now this is the portion too that everybody can unmute and ask your questions. And Tom, do you, do you have a preference on the, the lower wire height? Uh, I, I typically run just one poly wire. Uh, I do on some perimeter up against the neighbor's field, I might go a double, but, and then that'll be a steel, but typically it's just a poly because I want to be able to pull it down and put it up. Uh, I really think <laughs> some of the best fencing is a neighbor having black dirt, because why the hell would those cows want to go over there? Uh, so make, make it green where they are. If they're happy, there's plenty of food you know, very little trouble, but I always do, I do have a very nice hot zapper. So I make sure that they respect that fence. Well, Tom many brings times up. I've ran with it with no power at all, but I will say you want to make sure they're trained. Uh, and in the winter time, you know, when we get those frosts out there and a freeze and you got all the icicles on the trees, you typically will have to run out and run up and down those poly wires and kind of get that ice off of them because they'll sag. Uh, but works good. And is it because so, you have trained cattle that you can run one wire versus two or three? Yeah. Yes. Yes. If they've been, <clears throat> excuse me, if they've been behind, if they've been in a managed grazing system that's being managed by a single strand of poly wire, and that's what they're used to. I mean, I've run my animals over a quarter section of covers that that we rented in a quarter section of corn stalks and all we ran was polywire but that's what they were behind all summer that's what they're used to and when that trust it there also has to be that trust relationship like tom said you keep them happy why do they need to run across that black dirt or across the road unless they're being chased and if we look back at why <clears throat> cattle get out uh usually it's because somebody forgets to close the gate although i heard rumor of there's a video going around of some yep. steer that figured out how to open gate handles on electric fence. There's one answer for that. They need to go very quickly. They need to go goodbye. Okay. Cause they're going to train their buddies and take their buddies with them. But you know, if we've got fence jumpers, if we got fence breachers, the answer is that they got to go bye-bye. Um, but the number one reason for animals getting out is not the number of wires. It's because we as managers have failed to close a gate. We failed to turn the fence on. We failed to train them. We failed to feed them. We failed to give them water that they need. That's when they start getting out. If they're happy and content and you got a trust relationship with them, that they know you're going to come and make sure they got everything they need, they have no reason to go. Now, if they get chased, that's a different story. But I live in a part of the world where we have black bears, timber wolves, uh, coyotes, and cougars in the neighborhood. And it just, it's been a little bit of a problem once in a while, but they're not getting, they're not breaking through exterior fence. They're breaking through interior fence when they've been chased on that very, 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 very rare occasion. So um, yeah, I think a lot of us are used to driving down the road and seeing animals in the road ditch. But if we look across the fence at what's not there for them, um, that's often the bigger problem. So our management can go a long, long, long way to minimizing animals getting out. And then another question, how do you decide what cover crop species to use? So, you know, if we're, you know, utilizing cover crops to improve our soils or reduce Erosion, that's one thing, but when we're looking at using that as forage, um, what are you really, you know, using to select those different species? Uh, I, I, like, I, I talked a little bit about last week, but I, I like layers so that 
if I want to cut for forage, I take that top layer and then that bottom layer comes into play. So that's that's a mixture. I liked what Ken said about about three species of each variety is what I like. Three warm season, three cool season of legumes, three of that. And that's how I do it. I'm always after diversity. If it's going to be grazing later, I definitely geared towards something that'll stand better. Uh, if I I didn't talk about silver, but even if it's water situations, if I don't have a good way of getting water, you know, I'll go heavier with the brassicas because they will give, I, this year I cut out my brassicas and I had to water three times as much as I did last year. So I like a diversity. Diversity is always key. Get species from every group. What's your time frame of summer? You know, am I planting in June 1st or am I planting August 1st? That's a big difference. So. Is there any one special plant? No, I, I do have a base of plants. If it's gonna be looking for tonnage on a summer, then of course there's a sorghum sedan in there to give me tonnage, but I build the program around that one. If it's winter time and it's gonna be spring grazing, of course, winter rye is gonna be your, your staple and then add in the winter trip. And of course I like red clover does good for me too. So there really is no, that in stone it's just you got to find out that's what's going to work in your situation because everyone is different uh me and Kent we're a long ways away apart I mean the principles are the same but the species are are what we're changing and and we probably all have the same species just just we've adjusted the rates differently so think about your context and your resource concerns you have to answer those questions first one of your resource concerns is going to be feeding livestock. But if our other resource concern is building soil biology, keeping the soil covered, keeping a living root in the soil as long as possible, we're not going to take or eat everything out there. Um, otherwise, we're compromising other soil health principles. And that could be counterproductive for us. So think about what else you want to do out there? And so a lot of people will add things like flax, not the greatest forage, but a little bit of flax can go a very, very long way in building soil biology. Um, think about uh, safflower. Um, a lot of producers in the Western part of the state and in the Dakotas will include safflower, a very little bit of safflower in their mix because the cows aren't going to eat hardly any of it but it's gonna stay upright. It's gonna be able to catch snow for them. It's gonna keep a living root out there as long as possible. Not everything needs to be edible to the cattle. Um, it needs to also be edible and valuable to our livestock in the soil. So think about and address those resource concerns. If I'm on a sandy site, I'm gonna lean probably towards some of the millets versus like, like a forage sorghum or even corn in the mix. If I've got wet spots in the field, I'm probably going to include something like Japanese millet, which is probably what handles lower wetter ground better than other places. I've got some farms in northern Minnesota, they use a lot of Japanese millet just because their water table is so high. So your context is, is absolutely crucial. What class of animals going to go through here? Are, are you hoping to finish uh, steers and heifers on this for grass fed finish? then it better be heavy to be a Mars sorghum Sudan and you're probably going to want to graze it late summer, you know, versus grazing it in January. Not that you can have sorghum Sudan in, but like Tom said, we're going to also be adjusting the rates based on what we want to use it for. Um, think about what your top two or three things you want to accomplish out there. And once we get those taken care of, a lot of this gets, gets covered. Also think about termination. You know, if you're organic, you probably don't want to put yourself in a position where you've got a dependent chemical termination. So think about what, you know, our, our unfair advantage in Minnesota is that we get weeks like this in the winter, and that's going to pretty much cook anything that could winter kill in Minnesota, okay? There's some things that like cereal rye, they're going to survive. There's, you know, annual rye grasses. Some of those might even survive. I've seen turnips and radishes over winter when they get buried with 10 inches of snow in November and the ground never freezes. So think about how you want to terminate that. And if you want to terminate it, are you going to roller crimp it? Are you going to spray it? Are you going to, you know, do you need to till it? You know, what are you going to do? Think about how you want to do that termination. So all of those come in and then the time of the year, if we're going to be planting 
Uh, if we want to use something like BMR sorghum sudan and pearl millet in the, from central Minnesota north, we better have that in the ground before about the 10th of July, 15th of July at the very, very latest, or we're not going to get a lot of growth. If we're not going to get out there and plant until August, then we probably want to think about something like oats, you know, as being the base of our ration. So there, there's, there's people that can help uh, with this. You know, you've got the whole mentor group with the Soil Health Coalition. My SFA's got uh, three people on staff who can help with this stuff. Uh, you know, some of our NRCS and soil and water folks are getting very well, well versed in this stuff. Um, reach out, ask some questions, but first define, define your goals and your resource concerns for that site, and then have that cropping history, have that herbicide history in hand, and then we can start narrowing down. We can start focusing in on what's going to work in your particular situation. So in a sacrificial pat paddock that isn't flat, would you frost seed a complex species cover or would it be better to spread in the spring once the cattle are off? Could you say that again? Here first. So, yep, so it's a sacrificial paddock that is not flat. So we've got some topography on it. Would you recommend frost seeding a complex cover crop mix or would you prefer spreading it in the spring once the cattle are off of it? Frost seed or after the first round? Tom, you want to go first or do you want me to start? Uh, so sacrificial land that they're going to be, they can't plant in the fall? I'm wondering if it's for this year. Maybe Sounds like it's spring. perennial pasture right now is the way I'm interpreting it. Yep. And they're, they're beating it up uh, a bit right now. And the, I think the question is, what should we do? What should they do here in the next few months? Should they do something now with a, with a frost seed or should they wait and do something in the spring? I, I like, I like frost seeding. Um, but yeah. I, I would frost seed that, and I do frost seed like that. If I know that I have to do a lot, then I'll probably go drill something in the spring. But frosting is is a nice way to touch up something. I don't know if I would call frost seeding a good way to base your whole program off of. Just use it as a touch up. If you want to really change everything, then you got to go in and drill it in in the spring. Um, again, context, context, context. Um, I've done frost seeding on sandy knolls, gravelly knolls with some degree of success. Um, it does work better on clay soils uh, that tend to expand and crack and contract more and create uh, gaps. Um, it's February now. Uh, if I were going to frost seed and I'm still going to be feeding out there for <clears throat> the next you know, 60 plus days, I would do it now. Uh, I'd encourage you to do it now. Then the question is what to frost seed. We find that the small hard seeds tend to work best. Clovers um, are kind of the, the go-to. Um, I have successfully frost seeded brassicas, uh, turnips and radishes, and bird's foot trefoil, and timothy as a grass, and orchard grass. I've successfully frost seeded all those in uh, late February, early March. Um, just broadcast them out there and continue to feed over there. So, um, and I'd experiment with other things, but I'd stick to the smaller seeds for the best success. And you only need about a one to three pounds per acre out there. Um, again, what do you got available for equipment? Do you have a broadcast seeder? Is something you got time to do now? Um, if the snow is knee deep or, or, you know, you were pushing snow with the axle of the tractors you're spreading, that's a, excuse me, a little tough. You may have to wait um, to seed. If you don't have a broadcast seeder, but you can rent a no-till drill, no drill, that's the way to go. If you're going to go in um, uh, in the spring right away, I wouldn't use uh, warm season grasses. You need to wait for things to warm up then. And a lot of the success of this is going to depend on uh, how much bare ground you have out there. And I see TJ popped up here. I bet he's got some good ideas. Are you muted, TJ? 
I just got back in, so I don't. I had another company meeting that I had to go to, so I'm back from that. So okay. I don't know what the question is. So bring me up. To oh, that. no, that's fine. I can definitely give you my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> well, repeat the question. Let's let's hear what TJ's got because he's usually got some good ideas. So it's a sacrificial paddock that is not flat. Would you recommend frost seeding a complex cover crop mix, or seed it after the cattle are off this spring? I would I would get the cattle off it and seed it like Kent said. You if you want to use warm season grasses, if you wanted to get something out there in the spring in a frost seeding, that'd be okay. But you're going to be limited on what you can really make work at that point. You know your your medium red clovers, uh, some of the brassicas would be okay. The the bad part about seeding brassicas really early like that is to get more stringy because they try to go reproductive. They don't get those big leaves like they do when we seed them in the summer. So I'd be a little leery of that, but. I would rather see the cattle off from there. If you want to graze them in the spring, graze them and get the cattle off and get something really established. That way you got time to establish more grasses, more cocktail mix, and then get them back on there. So uh, that makes a great point, Kent. You, we have to really look at the, the, these crops and where they need to be planted because ground temperature is huge. You plant a summer annual in the spring, you'd be very disappointed in your stand if you have a stand at all. And then it's always the, the stuff you sold me didn't work. Well, right, because it wasn't put on at the right time. So I would get the cattle off so they don't puck it up. Because when that stuff's little and they, they snap it off at the ground level, that you're going to kill it. So I'd, I'd, I'd rather get the cattle off and then seed something and get it good established like Tom does. And then put them back. You saw the height of Tom's stuff? That's when I'd put them back in there. Let it get good establishment. So as they stomp around, they don't kill it when they're stomping around in it. I, I also wonder, again, we were talking about context earlier, um, if these cattle half, he called it a, they called it a sacrifice paddock. And, and, and if that means they're going to leave them out there until your perennial pastures are, are fit uh, for grazing, um, yeah, then the frost seeding may not work worth a hill of beans. They're going to be hammering that stuff right when it comes up. But the flip side of all this is, is there's the cheapskate way to go. And that's just, if there's any perennials out there now, just give it rest. Give it, you know, when things start growing, give it six to eight weeks of rest and see what comes on its own. It's amazing uh, on these sites that we've outwintered on in Balegrave. We've put all that carbon and fertility out there. We've had animal impact. Rest is, time is a great healer. And, and so sometimes just giving it rest can be uh, the cheapest and easiest and best thing we can do for that site. If there's perennials, some perennials already out there. And hey, so what? If, it, if it's, it's clay, it's gonna come up heavy to redwood pigweed. If it's sand, it's gonna come up heavy to lamb's quarter. But you know what? You graze that at the right time, it's pretty good cow feed. You know, and that's a great point, Kent. The other part is if you're gonna rest it like that, Go out there with some annual rye grass, some Italian rye, throw that out there early at the front and let that come up and fill in those gaps because that's really going to really work well at that point. You could do that if you're if you're willing to rest that area. Uh, same like Tom talked about his pastures, letting them rest. We have guys down in southern Iowa with pastures now that are going out and frost seeding all the time in the spring with uh, frosty bursine clover, medium red clover, uh, white clover, a uh, couple different grasses, you know, like an annual, like an Italian, maybe some fescue, and they leave it alone and they don't put the cattle back in until summer. Uh, let that stuff, you know, in the spring, everything's growing at the same time, so nothing gets ahead and smothers out. They've actually started to put a few, uh, like a little brassica in there just to, just to kind of have a, a mix it up a little bit. But if you can rest it, that's a great point, Kent, rest it. But then you can throw something out there to kind of fill in some bare spots. And for brassicas, I'd stay away from turnips, radishes. I'd think about some of the things like forage collards, um, kale, maybe ray, posja, uh, turnips, some of those that are more summer oriented, the, your purple top turnips, your radishes, like, like TJ said, they're going to want to bolt like right away and you're not going to get much out of them. And uh, <clears throat> I, I am semi-familiar with this paddock that uh, the question is about. Um, another option too, if, if that's your only area that you can do uh, your calving and have it as your sacrificial paddock, if you can't swap them to another site. Oh yeah, there you are. <laughs> you know, if, if you maybe like split it too and have them on, on one part of it and let the other part rest. I don't know, do you wanna talk more? I don't wanna call you out if you don't wanna you know it. 
No, that's okay. Uh, yeah, so some of the context is um, we've been calving on the same piece of ground for a long time, and it's uh, you can imagine what we've seen from that. So this was the next closest available pasture where we could open things up as soon as um, calves were coming, get them off the worst portion, get them on some grass. Well, now this will be year three of doing that. It's helped a lot with herd health, but now we're seeing it degrade really bad. And before it gets just as bad as where we started with the original calving yard, I want to get something going now to try and get ahead of it. So I guess I was just trying to figure out, you know, sooner versus later. I'm impatient. I didn't want to wait till fall. Uh, this is another one where if we have an outbreak in something, the cattle have to go through this pasture to get back to the working facility. Um, so that's another one where we tried really hard last year to make alleys and um, keep them off as much as they could. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, and they got out anyways. Um, so it's stuff that we're learning how to deal with as well, but just wanted some ideas of what we could maybe plant to help encourage um, more growth, different, different species, et cetera. Ashley, is it sandy? Is it clay? Is it loam? What is the soil type? Um, I'd probably claim it as more loam. Okay. So I would offer if one of the things we've done, I've, I've done with farmers on sites like this is if, if you can get in there early in the spring is do like um, almost like a nurse crop, like an oat barley mix, but uh, then throw in Italian ryegrass. You're going to have a lot of fertility out there and on heavier ground you got a chance to because Italian ryegrass will eat fertility like corn it takes fertility like crazy if you can't get out there early in the spring and you can't in it because it's too wet or whatever or other obligations and you're not going to get out there till the middle of May think about drilling uh, like a BMR grazing corn or just a cheap conventional corn out there just something and, and this is dependent on when you can get there in soil temperature but think about putting something out there if there's a lot of bare ground and a lot of fertility without being on the site, it's a little hard to say, but some of the sites that are really, really beat up and there's a lot of fertility, we're going in with annuals like Italian ryegrass if we can get in there earlier, corn if we got to get in there later, just to take advantage of the fertility, get something growing out there, uh, creating some feed uh, in the process. Those are some other options we've tried to, depending on how bad it's beat up. You know, another thing I look at too, Kent, that's a great, those are great points. I'd actually start adding some chicory into that mix. Uh, the beauty of chicory, it's a natural warmer for cattle and sheep. So I'd start getting that. It's a biennial crop. You're, you're going to establish it and it's going to come back for a few years. But a couple pounds of chicory goes a long ways. It's coming around a thousand seeds per pound. So a couple pounds of chicory is a, is a terrific in that mix. It takes drought well. So if it's drought prone later in the year, it's going to withstand that like the like the Italian rye would. So a combination of those put out there with like the grazing corn or grazing BMR or sedan grass, if it gets later into May, well, those would be good options for you on that, Ashley. Do, knowing it's a loam ground now and there's an extra, probably some extra fertility available we could get at. What, what time frame do you typically get on it and then off? <laughs> Um, are you calving? Are you calving we, really early? Or you... Yeah, we start April 1st on the main herd. Um, so we'll start really probably end of April, May, putting them out there. Um, and then once um, we try to wait until as much is greened up, but if it's wet, um, we want them off the main calving yard for coccidiosis. Yep. We don't want to, you know, we've been having that under control pretty well the last couple of years. And I think it's because of how we move the cattle and um, a couple other nutritional things that we're doing. But um, here's another question for you guys, if there isn't anything in your list, Jennifer. Okay. Um, so on the main, where the main calving yard is, it sits a lot higher and it's very sandy. And now we did just have um, a layer of long story short, we've just did rye grass out there um, to help fix that up. There was some mining going on and they just resloped it all, but it barely came up last fall. There's barely anything there. Um, so that's another one that it's basically black. And 
I'm not sure what, I feel like there's way more we could do other than just the rye. Um, but with it being sandy, what would you guys recommend in that? How many situation? acres? Um, probably site. 60, maybe, maybe more. And I'm it's, really reclaimed, bad <laughs> it's reclaimed gravel site basically is what it is. Yeah. So it was just, it's been mined for gravel the last three, four years. Um, how, and how far away from your headquarters? Is it adjacent to your farm headquarters? And your yeah, it's yep, pretty close. So I would encourage, we need carbon out there. And I would encourage you to think about, um, and you can even this winter, it's, there's still time, um, start systematically feeding out there. You can either unroll bales, you could feed TMR, kind of like the slides I had. <clears throat> uh, you, you, you know, um, and you could use that as a sacrifice area. Don't try and cover it all at once, okay? Take it in pieces and do a little bit at a time. Um, and I would also use that area as people call these sacrifice. I don't like calling them sacrifice paddocks. I like calling them opportunity paddocks because it's an opportunity to make it better. We can use that fertility and animal impact and importation of carbon to make it better. So it's something to think about, even if we get into a dry spell or a wet spell this year and you need a place to dump cattle for a while, target a spot like that to feed on. Do your supplemental feeding there. Let them spread manure out there. Put your carbon out there. You just got to figure out which way is going to work in your system. Can you just pre-place bales? Are you feeding baleage? You can just, you can see where you just fed the day before. You can systematically unroll bales across there in a pattern. Don't give them the whole thing. Make sure there's lots of rest built into this. Um, and it's amazing what we can do out there. It, we can stimulate latent seed banks without having to plant seed out there. But if the budget allows you to spread some seed out there, drill some seed out there before you feed them, there's lots of different things we can put out there uh, to make that happen. But we need carbon on that site, especially if it's sandy. Let's use this site to do some other things as much as possible. It doesn't have to be every day all the time, but as much as possible, as much as it makes sense, start systematically feeding out there to build fertility and not giving them access to everything. Like I had in that one picture, I showed you four years to where they were bale grazed. There was fences in between there and they only covered one spot in a year. Um, just do a little, it's a nice open winter right now and you're not calving for another month and a half. It may be something that even just to try for a month, to dip your toe in the water and get comfortable doing it. Think about that as a possibility. What, what is the cash crop that you're planning on doing out there or is it just going to be go to pasture? It's, it's always just been pasture. Um, the sandy there. part has just always for a few generations been the calving yard. So Ashley, when you said you planted rye, what, what did you plant annual rye grass? Did you plant cereal rye? What did you plant this fall? You know, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I'd have to ask my husband on that one. Okay. Because like a winter crop planted in the fall, a winter rye, winter trit, you're only going to see maybe two, three inches worth of growth on top, maybe four at the max because it's deep rooty. Okay. Uh, I like Kent's idea of, of moving them through. If you could move them through and control them like that, in the spring, I'd take certain areas and I would put in oats, barley, any of the spring grains because they have such a fibrous root network, you're going to start building that top two, three inches of soil with that fibrous root network, you're going to be putting carbon back in, like Kent talked about, mycorrhizal fungi host. And then you can start adding other species into that mix. But those spring cereals, that's that's a spot where they're fantastic because they they can take a lot of abuse of really tough soils. We work with a group in southern Illinois that reclaims coal mine farms down there. And that's how we start them out is we just go into spring cereals. And then we start adding stuff to the mix after they get so far in it. But you got to get that top couple inches with carbon, soil life, that fibrous root network in it. So those, those cereals really can do. And then get two, three inches tall and you put the cattle back on and let them beat them up a little bit, get it off, and then they go, let it grow again. So the control thing, like Kent talked about, is huge in that, in that point. The other thing is, as you another way to approach the grazing is get some biomass going up there get it to that boot stage, get it to that, you know, uh, milk stage, and then high stock densities with cattle in there and trample a lot of that. 
uh, out there to get some ground cover out there to get some carbon on the ground um, can be a great way to go. That's going to require multiple paddock shifts a day in order to get higher stock densities. We can help you figure that out. That's, you know, not a huge deal, but uh, if you've got poly wire and step in posts, that's going to be probably the fastest way across those acres. And then just concentrating that we're going to put some management effort and using the cattle to reclaim that site. Uh, we just have to make sure that we plan for that as, as we develop our plans going into the summer. So we've got the time to do it. But think about taking no more than 50%, stomping a lot with high density grazing, get more manure distribution out there coupled with these other things. Um, the more things we throw at this, the faster it's going to recover. And, and TJ is right. We can recover some pretty beat up sites by doing this stuff. Uh, Ashley, I like to give multiple different plantings. So, you know, if you spread something out in spring, come back and, and you can plant a warm season later on. And grant that warm season is not going to be there next year, but you can come in and plant. I, I use my Kinsey planner to do that a lot of times, just drop in something extra and just always kind of, you're trying to get stuff cycling through the soil. And so if you have different crops growing, that helps and everything together, working together is gonna to be way better, so. Do you have pack yep. and slurry or slurry manure available on the farm? Nope, no nope. scrapings, no lot scrapings, no bedding pack. Not no. really, I mean, we've got a small, okay. small amount that we do spread out on the pastures um, and we just rotate which pasture gets it. Um, just cause yeah, it's not, it's not very much. Do you have access to poultry bedding or hog slurry in your area or dairy slurry? Um, we've, we do, yep. And we actually, um, we usually try and get that for our row crop ground, but I don't think we've ever done it on pasture. So one of the things I would offer is, um, which, which one of those are, can you get? Just so I know which one um, is. Hog and poultry, poultry or... but we usually get okay. hog. Okay, hog slurry, okay. So something I would offer as an option is as you get stuff growing out there, when it gets to be four to six inches tall, going in and doing during the growing season, going in and doing a light application, three to 4,000 gallons an acre, a light application of slurry to really jumpstart that. We need to build bio, above ground biomass. We need photosynthetic panels up there creating carbon that it can pump in the soil through that fibrous root system to feed the biology. And on a low fertility site like this, just a little tiny boost of manure can go a long way. We don't wanna slug it with, you know, eight to 18,000 gallons an acre. We want three or 4,000 an acre during the growing season when the, that green stuff's about four to six inches in height. Otherwise we, we can have some problems. And then stay off of it for, you know, about 30 days. And then it could be harvested. It should be grazed, high stock density grazed for trample. And that could be done multiple times a summer too. Uh, you may have a rye crop that comes up this spring. It could hit it then. You plant another warm season cover like Tom was talking about. Do it, do it before when that gets going. Uh, hit it twice if you can. A lot of times the equipment's sitting there idle that time of year. And so you can get those things done. So check that out as an option. Yeah. Thank you guys. I appreciate all this. <laughs> and that's something too, actually, with the with the slurry. If you do something like Tom said, put that warm season grass in, they are luxury consumers of nitrogen. And to make them work the best, they got to have ant. So <laughs> we've had guys try it and failed at it because they don't give them any nitrogen. And they get they get a crop, but they don't get the crop and the protein they could get. So where Ken's talking about using the slurry, that's a great way. And then add like what Tom said, add the small, the warm season grasses, but you got to feed them too, because if that ground is that depleted, there's nothing in them for them to survive off from. And they'll, it'll grow, but it look, it's pretty spindly and rotten looking. And the quality isn't there, but the, with the slurry and that, now you got the quality in the, in the forage crop too. I just have you guys come with me whenever I'm working with producers on, you know, different grazing sites and management plans. Like this would be awesome. <laughs> the trifecta, you could call it the trifecta approach. 
right? <laughs> like I said at the beginning, you get two or three people. Um, it's a much richer experience for the audience. So, and we've got we've got lots of good people on on the call today. So it makes it that much better. Absolutely. Oh, okay. All right. We got another one. Could Kent and Tom go over again how they set up and take down semi permanent fence for two to three strand wire efficiently and economically? Like supplies, material, type of posts. Buy, so, buy the good roller. Yes. You know, the, the geared roller is huge. You will spend forever if you don't get a geared uh, roller because, yeah, it's a lot for of poly wire. For poly yep, wire. For poly wire. Yep. For poly wire. Poly wire is everything I use. So, so for I, this, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Kent. So for this two strand hard wire semi permanent, it's high tensile wire. It's 14 gauge instead of the standard 12 and a half gauge. The reason being it's a little lighter, making it easier to handle. Um, the, the corner posts are six inch diameter treated posts, eight feet long, set 48 inches in the ground. In a lot of cases, those can stay put if we intend to come back to the, that field three, four, five, six years from now, okay? Uh, what comes out then is the wire and the, the fiberglass line posts. The fiberglass line posts are seven eighths inch diameter. They're five feet long. They're a Minnesota made product out of um, geotech or common sense fence down in Stewartville, Minnesota. Um, for perimeter fence, most people find that the ones that are pre-drilled are easiest to use. Uh, there are just simple clips that attach that on. You can make your own clips if you want. It's not hard. You sit around a cold winter evening, make all the clips you need for the next season. Um, and you you need a you need a way. You're going to need a, a bare minimum a wire payout spinner or what the people down under call a spinning jenny um, to put this wire out and wind it up. There's two. Uh, you can do it that way with a regular spinning Jenny. Um, Ken Coves makes one that's specially designed to wind things back up. There's an outfit in South Dakota called Common Sense Manufacturing that makes one that mounts on the three point on the tractor with a hand clutch. Just make sure you get the spool for high tensile wire, not the one for, for soft wire, soft steel wire. Um, I don't know, they're like $1,500, um, but boy, they're slick uh, to wind that high tensile wire up. And so what you're gonna do to pull it is you're gonna first shut the power off, you're gonna take the tension off, um, you're gonna cut it at strategic points, okay? And yes, you can cut this stuff because if you do a good job crimping it or use the gripples uh, to reattach it, that's gonna be stronger than the wire itself, okay? If you do that right. So we're not worried about that but you're gonna cut it at a strategic point. Somebody's gonna hang on to the end. The other person's gonna wind it up. Oh, there's another winder that's by hand that mounts on the, like the side of the truck, like on a flatbed truck. You could probably mount it on the side of a trailer and it's a big spool like this. You do it by hand. None of these are super hard. I've done this myself a number of times. It's not a big deal. Um, anyway, somebody hangs on to the end because this wire has memory. You're gonna unclip it one at a time, wind it up, go back and unclip the second one, wind it up. Your clips may or may not, depending on the type of clip you use, may be reusable or not. That's cheap end of this stuff. When you get it wound up, put at least three, uh, preferably four, I use those big zip ties uh, and, and tighten those on there. Put a label on it, either on how long it is or where it came from. If it's a half mile long, quarter mile long, 400 feet long, put a la label it with a tag, then you can take it off of that and hang it up. The fiberglass posts, you just go tweak the tops a couple times, they pop right out generally, unless it's really mucky ground. A uh, heck of a lot easier than steel tees, I guarantee it. And even easier than um, the timeless fiberglass fence posts will work in this situation. Also, they're just a little more flexible. Um, that's another option. Um, and then the grounding system, a lot of people just leave those. If it's just three ground rods, you put them somewhere where you're not going to run over them, GPS them so you know where they're at uh, in the future, or put it on a map, file it away. Uh, you're not leaving that much money behind, but it can save you a lot of labor. So for the high tensile, 
that's pretty easy. Basically, you're pulling the energizer, the power source, if it's a battery, uh, the, the line posts, and um, the high tensile wire, and then set it up, do it in a way that it's organized. And then when you go to the next spot, you're ready to go. So if it's set up for a 40 acre field, boom, you know what it's what's ready to go there and you can make that happen pretty easy. And once you do this and you have the skill sets and we're gonna be doing some training uh, sessions this spring and into this summer on high tensile fencing. We did a bunch last fall. Um, it's a great way to uh, do that. Um, uh, so it's pretty easy to do. It takes, once you get it down, it, it taking it down takes less time than putting it up. So most people are shocked and surprised how little labor it takes to pull it down. And then you can use it on another field and another field and another field, so. Yeah, I, I will say when, you, when you're fencing like your cash crop acres, uh, I generally take my, my solid poles and go back I have a 120 foot sprayer boom. So I go 130 foot back from the corners and then I just angle that corners. So I don't never have a problem with uh, livestock or if I'm bringing a water truck out there, I can pull in there and there's no problem with someone hitting these damn posts and busting one off. So I generally keep them away from the corners and then just make up fences just for those, you know, quick attach uh, poly for those spots. Back to you, Jennifer. <laughs> All right, last call, everybody. If you've got a question, it's your last last chance. Um, so if you've got a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. But I also want to let you guys know um, these are recorded and we put them on our website. So if you didn't get to see the whole thing, or so, you know someone else could benefit from hearing from it, or you couldn't write down fast enough with what they're saying. They'll be they'll be on the Minnesota So Health Coalition website, so you can access them under resources and videos. Um, and also, the winner of the free uh, "Talk Dirty to Me" T-shirt today is Andrew Byron. So congratulations, Andy! I'll get a hold of you to figure out what size you want. Um, otherwise, last call for questions. I, I will say when when you're doing when you're doing forage uh, cover crops, always think in layers, you know, different layers because you graze through fast, you clip off those tops, and then you have a whole nother another undergrowth coming back through. And it doesn't matter if it's in with the corn interseed or in a pasture. You want different levels and that way you have different nutrients cycling at the right time and just it, it, it works good to have that in your game plan. So Excellent. Well, thank you, Tom, Kent, and TJ for providing all this great info and content. And if anybody has questions, get a hold of me. But otherwise, enjoy the rest of the beautiful day.